Hi, this is Light From Above with David Kinney. I'm a guest speaker today. My name's Luke Taylor, and I hope to bring you a message from God's Word that can be helpful to you. Thank you for tuning in. You know, the older that I get, and I realize I'm not that old, but the older I get, the less I trust people. And you might say, well, that, well, that sounds kind of bad. It's kind of depressing that the older you get, the less you trust people. But I would suggest that, that probably uh, it's the same for you. Uh, the older that you get, the less you trust people. When you're a, when you're a kid, uh, you believe that everyone's out to, to do good, don't you? No one's going to uh, do anything uh, that would be mean to you, or no one's going to cheat you, or no one's going to, to do anything that would, would harm you. But as you get older, you realize that, unfortunately, there are some people out there in the world who are willing to do you harm or are willing to take advantage of you if, if uh, they have the opportunity. And so we begin to trust people less. In some ways it's a good thing, and in some ways it's a bad thing. Uh, our culture especially has, has given children a reason as they, they grow up and they get older to, to trust people less. You think about uh, some of the things that, that happen uh, in our country today with uh, things like the divorce rate. You know, parents come before God and, and they make a commitment. And uh, some have children before they are married, some only afterwards. But they make this commitment and they say, until death do us part, right? For better or for worse, uh, in sickness or in health. But then sometimes, uh, a year later or a couple years later or maybe a decade later, we, uh, the parents decide that, that they're going to split up. And they've made this commitment not only to themselves, but also uh, to the children who were born into that marriage. And we realize that, well, <clears throat> maybe their promise wasn't worth all that much. Maybe, maybe I don't really have a, a great reason uh, to put my trust in people, because people make promises like this, and then it ends up being the case that they don't follow through with them. But I think if we're not careful, one thing that we can do is, is that we can allow uh, that mistrust of, of certain people to bleed over into our relationship with God. And sometimes we look into God's Word and, and we read some promise that's made there and, and we find that uh, we, we are thinking in our heads, well, well, yeah, God said that, but I don't know, maybe, maybe God won't follow through with that promise. Maybe He's like these other people who have broken promises to me or have taken advantage of me. Perhaps God isn't going to follow through with what he said he would. But I think we need to be careful against this. But, and, and rather than looking at, at God's word and, and saying, you know, I, I don't know that he'll follow through. What I hope to do this morning is to show you from the scriptures that when you look at God's word, you can be sure that God's word is true, that he will keep his word, and that, is, that, is a, that it is a faithful saying. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, uh, we have there written for us and recorded in the Bible this verse. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That's a wonderful verse, isn't it? That God not only makes promises, but the promises that he makes are faithful, and he'll keep them even to a thousand generations. The word there in the Hebrew, the original language that is written in, uh, means and, and car carries this idea to build up or to support, uh, to foster as a parent, to be permanent, or to be morally true or certain. <clears throat> this is the idea that, that you can lean on this message. <clears throat> uh, there's some things that I wouldn't lean on. Uh, there's some uh, lecterns out there in the world that I've preached on that I wouldn't lean on. But this one's, this one's pretty sturdy. But this is the idea of that word. It says God's, God's word is, is faithful. God's word is true. And this is something that we can lean on. We can put all our weight on it and be sure that it can hold us up. Be sure that the promises it makes are, are trustworthy. Our main text today is going to come from the book of 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. And I want to read that with you uh, here today. Uh, Paul here is writing to Timothy, uh, one of his students and a young man that he has mentored. And Paul writes, it is a faithful saying. There's our word again, faithful saying. This is something you can lean on. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, 
we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. And think about the context of this verse. Here we find Paul. Paul, the, the, the old apostle, the old servant, soldier of the cross. And we find him here in prison. This is possibly the last letter that was ever written by the apostle Paul. And he writes it to Timothy. And Paul, at this point, is, is facing uh, the threats of death for his faith. And we have Paul writing to Timothy, and, and he writes Timothy, and he says, Look, Timothy, you don't need to be worried. You don't need to be concerned. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid, afraid about. If, if anyone uh, should be afraid, it's me. I'm the one who's risking my life uh, for the message of Christ. Uh, he says, but don't worry about me. He says, you don't need to worry about me because I am in a trustworthy state. He says, I know the promises that God has made to me. I know that God promises that if I endure this life and the sufferings that, that will come along with it, the sufferings that I'm going to have to endure for Christ, that in the end, I'm going to live with Christ uh, on into eternity. And he knows that those promises are true and that they're faithful. And he writes to Timothy and he says, Endure. Endure this life and the things that come with it. And the promises of God wait for you at the end. That's the first observation. This, this observation that, that, that Paul knew and Paul understood that, that those promises were trustworthy. The, sec <clears throat> excuse me, the second observation we can learn from this text today uh, is that all of these statements are conditional statements. God's word is true. It's faithful. You can lean on it. We know that. We know that for sure, and Paul knew it. But he also understood that, that God's promises were conditional. He understood that uh, there was something, there was a requirement that, that he had to fulfill in his life in order to uh, receive these, these promises that have been promised by God. Notice the word that every single one of these verses begins with. That's that short two-letter word, if. If is an important word. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 gives us this same idea. He says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. It was conditional. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Paul writes again there, and he says, And you, who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Notice the very next word in the very next verse. He says, the Lord is willing to give you all of these things and to do all these things for you if, verse 23, ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. It was conditional. And so uh, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, if you're willing to suffer, then God is, is going to be there at your side when the end comes. He says, if, if you believe, the Lord is going to reward you. But these are conditional statements. God holds up His end. We can be sure of that. We must hold up our end as well and, and do the things that He has asked us to do. Paul writes, endure unto death, and the Lord's promises can be leaned on when this life is over. But I want to notice a third observation from from this text this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, the second verse that we read. Notice what Paul writes. He says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. We read that verse and we think, well, I don't know, I like that verse as much as I like the other ones. The other ones seem pretty nice. They, they were promises of blessing. And here we read this verse, I don't, I don't know that I like that one as much. Paul writes and he says, if, if you die with Christ, you will live with Christ. If you endure with him, then you're going to reign with him. And we think, yeah, we like that. Preach on, preacher. We like to, to hear the promises of blessing, but he also says, and we, we can't exclude this verse. He says, if you deny him, he will deny you. It's similar to what we read in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. The first verse there says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. 
that's a, a beautiful thought, to think that Christ will one day confess our name if we confess His here on earth. But we have to notice the next verse as well. It's, it's just as important. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. I think the truth is that, that there are a lot of people who do believe the promises of God, who do believe uh, that God is going to come through on the, on the promises of blessing that He makes. But I think there's a lot of people who don't trust in or, or don't believe that God's threats of punishment are as faithful as His promises of blessing. And so we hear the, the preacher say that, that, that uh, God will, will bless us, and, and we agree with that. And, and sometimes we hear the preacher say, or not the preacher, but the Word of God say, uh, that, that if uh, we are not faithful to God, then, then He is not going to bless us, that He will punish us. And some people think, well, no, I don't believe that. You know, God would, God would never do that. God would never punish someone uh, for eternity. And I began to ask myself, well, why is that? Why is it that, that some people believe God's promises of blessing, but don't believe His promises of punishment? And I began to think, and I, I thought, well, <clears throat> maybe, it has to do with, maybe it has to do with the way we were raised. You know, I like to blame problems on my parents. It's a convenient excuse. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it has something to do with the way that we are raised, way, the, the way that parents raise up their children. You ever see parents and their, their child's having a... a uh, temper tantrum in, in the store, in Walmart, or in Kroger, and, and they look at their child and they say, you know what, if you don't stop that, I'm going to take away every toy you ever had for the next two years. And then the, the temper continues and, and ultimately nothing is done. They made an empty threat. Sometimes we see people, if you don't stop that tantrum, I'm going to count to three. Parents go, one, two, three. <laughs> and oftentimes, the, the threats of punishment that parents make are ultimately empty threats. They don't follow through with those things. And, and, and children learn very quickly when, when we make empty threats. Uh, they catch on pretty quick. They're not as dumb as we sometimes believe that they are. I uh, worked at an after-school program for inner-city kids for a while after, uh, or actually during college. And uh, some of these kids weren't the best behaved kids. Some of their parents sent them there because they didn't really want to deal with them, so they sent them to us. And I remember the first couple weeks that I was there, I, I thought to myself, uh, you know, my, my children, the, the kids, I had 10 kids, I thought, you know, the, the, the children that I am in charge of, they're going to be disciplined. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be in line. Uh, they're never going to get out of line or else they're going to be disciplined for it. I'm going to have the best group of kids in the whole entire camp. And so when one of the kids would act out or do something that he wasn't supposed to do, I would threaten him with something, something terrible, uh, something, something uh, that would just ruin his day. But ultimately, something that I really couldn't follow through with. You know what? And this worked great. It worked real great for the first two weeks. Uh, and then I realized, well, really, my children realized uh, that... I couldn't do a lot of the things that I threatened them with. Even though they, they sounded terrible and I, I threatened terrible things against them, I, I couldn't follow through with them. And so eventually I had to come up with a new uh, management strategy. But, but they realized when I made an empty threat. My father used to sit me down at the kitchen table for dinner, and mom would make uh, like broccoli or... Uh, asparagus. You know, and, and there's very few things in life that are as terrible and as, uh, that are, are as great a cause of suffering as broccoli and uh, vegetables. Vegetables in general are just terrible. Salad is, is terrible. And, and my father would say to me, he would say, <clears throat> Luke, uh, you know, you're not getting up from this table until you eat your broccoli. <clears throat> a couple times I thought to myself, ah, he won't make me sit here. He'll give up eventually. But you know what? <clears throat> there were nights that I sat at the table for two hours, three hours, uh, four hours sometimes, because I didn't want to eat my broccoli. But you know what? And, and some people would say, 
well, that's just mean. Why, why would you make your, your child stay there for, for all this time just because he won't eat his broccoli? You know, that, that's child abuse. <clears throat> and I would respond this way this morning. That's not child abuse. That's called being faithful. And maybe we should start parenting our children more like we parent, or more like God parents us. Uh, that when He makes a promise to us, we can be sure that God's promise is faithful, that He's going to keep it even though even if it's a threat of punishment. And so we have to believe God's promises of blessing and God's promises of punishment. I also thought, you know, maybe, maybe people don't believe God's promises of, of punishment uh, because we just skip over them sometimes. As a, as a preacher, it's easy to preach a, a message that's all about blessings. That's all about uh, things that are good, all the good things that God is, is going to do for us if we're faithful. And people like to hear that. People don't really like to hear God's promises of punishment. And so I thought perhaps people don't believe in God's promises of punishment because we just skip those verses. We don't preach on those verses. We don't teach on those verses. And the reason that I know that that can be done is actually because I did it to you already today. You remember we read Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. Remember this verse, it says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. That's a beautiful passage, isn't it? I really like to to hear a sermon on that. But you know what the very next verse says? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 10, here's the verse I skipped. And repayeth them that hate Him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth Him he will repay him to his face. You know, I don't want the Lord repaying anything to my face. Uh, I'm afraid of that. But you know, I need to hear that. It's essential that I hear that. Because even though I've heard God's promises of blessing, uh, we can be sure that those are faithful, but we can be just as sure that God's promises of punishment are as faithful and as sure as those promises of blessing. So I have to hear both. It's necessary that we preach both the good things and the bad things. And we can't leave these things out. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 uh, reads, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is going to keep His promises, and it's His desire that everyone come to repentance and be saved and get to enjoy those blessings. But ultimately... He is going to keep the promises that He made. And one of those promises is that if you deny Christ, then Christ will deny you. So let us make sure that we believe both the good things and the bad things that are recorded for us in Scripture. The very last observation that I'd like to take from this text this morning is from the 13th verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. I think there's some people who have a hard time believing the promises of God because of something that they've done in their life, of some sin that they've committed or some struggle that they have, maybe on a daily basis, maybe on a monthly basis. And they say, you know... There are things that I do that I struggle with that I can't seem to to get over. And even though they're genuinely trying, they say, I just just don't know that God will forgive me. I don't know that God will keep His promises to me because of of these things that I've done. But the Bible says, and it's a wonderful thing, that our actions, our... uh, The, the things that we uh, struggle with, the times that, that we fail God, really have no effect on God. And let me explain that statement uh, very briefly to you. That doesn't mean that if we are disobedient, God will forgive us anyway at the end of time. What that means is that, that, it, that my sin, the things that I commit in my life that, that I think are so terrible, ultimately have no effect on the promises that God has made to me. God's promises are still sure. 
God's promises are still faithful because I cannot change God. And it's against God's nature to lie or to say something that isn't true. And so the promise that God makes to me in the scriptures, no matter what I do, no matter what I involve myself in, if I am willing to come to God in repentance, he is willing to forgive me. And that's a wonderful thought. My, uh, my sin cannot change the promises of God. God says, even if, you, even if you do this, even if you go back on your word as, as human beings so often do, he says, I remain faithful. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. A great example of this comes to us in the book of Hosea. <clears throat> Hosea is a, a really interesting book. Uh, Hosea is the man of God, and God tells Hosea, he says, I want you to go out and I want you to marry a woman who is a harlot. I want you to marry a woman who is a prostitute. And, and Hosea must have thought, you know, why? Why on earth would I, why would I do this? Why, why would you have me do this? I'm, I'm God's man. I'm your man, God. Why would you have me marry a, a woman like this? And God tells Hosea, he says, because I want Israel, I want the children of Israel to know what it's like to be married to her. And that's a powerful statement. The children of Israel uh, throughout all time, uh, throughout, uh, from, from the time they were established to, as a people to the time that they were taken away in, in uh, captivity, uh, they were always unfaithful to God. They were always going back on the things that they had promised to God. And God says, I want you to do this, Hosea, because I want to show the children of Israel what it's like to be married to her. And so Hosea does this, and he marries this woman, and he goes... <clears throat> and he takes her into her house, and you think that she would be extremely thrilled. But ultimately, in chapter 3 of his book, uh, she ends up going back into her sin. And God tells him in that same chapter, now I want you to go get her back. She left, she went off into her sin, into fornication, sexual sin, and God says, well, I want you to go take her back now. You think, no, no, why would I do that? Why on earth would I... <laughs> Would I take back this woman who was unfaithful to me? And God says to Hosea again, he says, because this is what I have done. This is what I have done with my people. They have left me time and time again. They have been unfaithful to me time and time again, but I have always been faithful to them. I am always willing to take them back. I paid the price to get them back. And ultimately, that is the same promise that God makes to us today. <clears throat> God says, I am willing to take you back. Just like those children of Israel, I am willing to pay the price to take you back, even though you've been totally unfaithful to me. If you are willing to come back, I'll take you back. He says, I have paid the price. Hosea paid the price to take her back. God paid the price to bring the children of Israel back. You know what? God has paid the price to bring you back. No matter what you've done, God says to you, come back to me. Come back to me and I will buy you back. I have paid the price. I have paid a great price for you. Come and lay your sins at the cross because I have paid for it with the blood of my son. It's a beautiful promise. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, there's our word, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. God is true. And you can believe that. You can be sure of the promises of God. Thank you for tuning in to this program uh, today. I hope that it has been some benefit to you. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven.
Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.